Hello, I'm Colin Baker. Of course I am, whether you like it or not. And you are watching The Sirens of Audio. Keep watching. It's good. Hello, me one. Hello, me two. I'm very excited about today's guest. Oh, I didn't know we had a guest. Who is it? I'll give you a clue. He does the voices of the Ice Warriors. Um, I can't remember who does those voices. Any clues? He also does the voices of the Cybermen. I should know this, but no. You will remember who does the voices of the Daleks. Well, this is embarrassing. I, um, nope. Sorry, I never do read the credits. Well, surely he know who I'm talking about now. Ah, Six Squid. Of course. I've been wanting to have Toby Longworth on the show for ages. Let's just get on with the show, me one. Files, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores the universe of Doctor Who in the audio medium. My name's Dwayne. And my name is Philip. G'day, Dwayne. G'day, audiophiles. G'day, Philip. You know it's a good one, don't you? They're all good. Yes, all our I episodes. Know. <laughs> but this is exciting. This is one that we've been waiting for, and we have been pestered by a few of our listeners to be all, to get for a long time. We have. We have. We are actually going to be speaking very shortly with Nicholas Briggs, uh, a man who needs very little introduction in the world of audio Doctor Who, uh, and in fact, TV Doctor Who, very well known as well uh, as the voice of the Daleks. So uh, it's going to be great to have a chat with him. And uh, I know we talk a lot, Philip, about uh, about having longer episodes, but we are probably, probably going to split this one up. We'll see what um, over, happens. Over a few episodes. We'll just we'll just see where the conversation takes us. Uh, and uh, so that could be very interesting. Before we get to Nick's chat with us, you know what we got to do, Philip? No, Dwayne. What do we have to do? Don't you roll your eyes at me. There's a rabbit hole. We're going in. Let's go. <laughs> Right, Philip, it's it's that time again where we've entered the rabbit hole and I don't know what the topic is because you're going to tell me. Oh, why'd you do this to me? <laughs> you lousy man. <laughs> well, I want to have a turn. You're always okay. having a turn. Well, okay, well, okay. The topic is Dalek voices. As Ooh. we have as we have Nicholas Briggs on today and he is a aficionado of Dalek voices... Before we get going, tell me what what do you like in a Dalek voice? Are there Dalek voices in particular throughout the series that you th that stand out, and what do you not like? Well, I've got to tell you that the Dalek voices that do stand out to me are probably those from Revelation of the Daleks. So, really? which is very strange because they're a little bit different to. There's a couple of different ones in. I think Roy Skelton's in there. Um, I think Brian Miller was an interesting one. Was he in Revelation of the Daleks? Or, I think he was. He was he's definitely a, in Resurrection. Definitely Resurrection. I know that for a fact. So I, I could be there. So the the Roy Skelton voice is a, is a hard one for me because I did grow up watching Rainbow. So I always hear Zippy uh, when I hear a Dalek voice. Uh, however, he did. He, I mean, he did do them well, although. The ones that obviously are probably the worst would have to be the Day of the Daleks ones. They're a little bit, little bit jolting, uh, those ones. 
Of course, we had Michael Wisher come in and do the Dalek voices for a couple of episodes before he took on Davros, didn't we? We did. He, I mean, he must have just had no idea what he was doing. Is all I can imagine in, in De- Dave. Daleks. Well, that, I, was, I, that wasn't Michael Wisher, though. I don't no, know no, who that was. I, I just think because it's been so long. I mean, that had been the longest the Daleks had been off air for. And I think maybe it's the longest they've been off air for. Um, I just think they'd forgotten what to do because it was just shocking. It's interesting watching the new DVD when Nick has done the voices. There's a, there's a version with Nick's voices. It's much better. Yes, it is. It is a very good... Spe- it's probably one of the best special editions out there, Day of the Daleks. With all the uh, extra Ogrons and Daleks, and it becomes a real battle at the end. Yes. Yes, it's fantastic. They even added scenes. Yes. It's incredible. Yeah, it, looks, it looks fabulous. But as far as voices go, the black and white voices are pretty iconic as well. To me, I find particularly the, the, the very original Daleks episode very, very creepy stuff. Uh, I always found them, uh, because, because I'd gone back to the black and white era, it wasn't my first Dalek experience. It was a little bit strange hearing them for the first time, but yeah, pretty pretty iconic for the black and whites. Yeah. Uh, what what about you? Um, well, I guess to me now, I mean, the Daleks now are Nick Briggs in terms of the Dalek voices. And it's interesting because part of the issue with the first first and second Doctors, is sometimes I really struggle to understand what they're saying. And so I think one of the things I've appreciated with Big Finish Daleks, and then, of course, <laughs> the TV series has stolen them for Big Finish, was the fact of the clarity of the voice. Because the reason why Terry Nation invented Davros, of course, was because Daleks can't have conversations. Whereas we now know that's not true. We've actually seen you know, Daleks have amazing conversations and you know many different sorts of Daleks having conversations. Mm. And some of the new stuff that came out with Time Lord Victorious in particular, we, we've been commenting on just the change of voice and knowing which Dalek is speaking because it's so obviously distinct. And, you know, the Emperor Dalek. So, yeah, so to me, I guess Nick Briggs now is the Daleks. But in terms of when I still go back, I still love the Death of the Daleks, Dalek voices. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one of the, my favourite shows in terms of my favourite Dalek shows from way, way back when. Uh, they don't say much in Genesis Daleks and they're not quite running Destiny. So I guess when they come back in Resurrection... Of the Daleks, that that to me starts to be a bit more what I expect too. So yeah, it's a it's just a yeah. Thought I'd throw that out there in terms of what you like. It's funny, funny you, you mentioned Destiny. I think they're quite poetic in Destiny, don't they? Isn't that where they? Oh, they're, they're poetic in in quite a few stories. Is it? Don't they say in the Chase? Don't they say advance and attack, attack and destroy, destroy and rejoice? Is that what they say? Rejoice? I'm really? sure they say rejoice. Yeah, I'm positive. Okay. I, I I'm really going to have to go back and check it out now. If I can find that clip, I might insert it right here. Okay. Advance and attack, attack and destroy, destroy and rejoice. So either I did find the clip or I didn't. <laughs> and there's a little awkward pause there. So so Destiny, yeah, that that's... The, the, po- the poetry in Destiny, it was, um, I, I can't remember the words off the top of my head now, but I just remember it was very, so poetic, it was funny. Seek and locate. Do not deviate. Well, the, the best poetry, of course, is the Daleks doing Shakespeare in Time of the Daleks. Mm-hmm. So that, that, that to me was, um, you know, she- Daleks quoting Shakespeare is one of the funniest things yeah. I've heard Daleks do. Well, we did have recently... Have you seen the Evil of the Daleks animation yet? I bet you haven't. No, I haven't. <gasps> oh, that's terrible. I we do have, have it. I own it at least. We have we have the Daleks towards the end of one episode uh, spinning around saying, Dizzy, Dizzy, Dizzy Daleks. Yes, well, I, I have heard that on the audio several times. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. I will, yeah. I will eventually watch the DVD. I just haven't got to it. I've been busy. I've been watching Obi-Wan and... I'm actually working through all the Marvel films at the moment with two of my children from in chronological order from beginning to end. So that's okay. taking up a bit, a bit of time. Fantastic. All right, let's get out of the rabbit hole. We'll, we'll uh, have a chat with Nick Briggs in a moment. But to lead us in, I will throw in a trailer for one of my favourite of Nick's experimental stories, and that is Creatures of Beauty. Check this out. <laughs> oh! Beauty. Look at him, just wandering about. <laughs> we better get out of here. Ah! You're right. <coughs> just about. 
looks like the console is going to catch fire. She'll be all right. Ah! They're on to us. Hold on tight. Well, this is all very fascinating, Lady Fulian. Tell me, am I a prisoner here? Stop it! No! Stop it! Let go! Let go of the line! No! Ah! Please don't! Ah! Because whatever they said they'd do, I can do worse. Bring them to me! I'm guessing we don't have a choice. Didn't you say there are always choices? Not if we want to get off this planet. Doctor, this is getting distinctly uncomfortable. I know. And if it takes the rest of my miserable life, I shall not lay down and die until I've made sure that filthy aliens have finally left us alone. Is that what you do? Travel around the galaxy making light of other people's problems? I'm not making light of them. I'm trying to understand them. Trust is a commodity in somewhat short supply in this sector of the galaxy. What a pity. Well, a man that needs very little introduction in Doctor Who is Nicholas Briggs. Welcome, Nick. Hello. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> uh, of course, you're you're famous in, in Doctor Who on television, audio. You've been around in uh, fandom for a long time. Sometimes us long-term fans don't like to think about how long we've been around in fandom. But what I wanted to start off by asking you is hmm. is uh, about your childhood. Where did you grow up and what was your family life like uh, in your young days? Well, I was born in uh, a village called Lindhurst in the New Forest, which is in the, uh, the sort of central south coast area of England. Uh, you see that little sort of diamond-shaped island off the coast there. That's the Isle of Wight. And I did actually spend a year of my childhood living there as well. Um, yeah, so that's how I was brought up in a, a, a little housing estate in a quite small bungalow. It was right next to, you know, countryside um, in a place called uh, Totten. I was born in Lyndhurst, ended up living there. <laughs> I don't know how interesting any of this is. Ended up living there when I was about, I don't know, 13 or 14. But I lived in a, a place called uh, Totten, which had the distinction of being the largest village in the UK for many years, and then they eventually just gave up and made it a town. Um, it's near Southampton, if that's helping anyone uh, locate it. And my upbringing was, I've got an elder brother who's nine years older than me. After my brother was born, my mother then, next time round, because they wanted another child, she had a miscarriage and um, was told she wouldn't be able to have children. And nine years later, I was a bit of a surprise. And it says something about the way parents in their sort of gruff, you know, back in the 60s sort of way of speaking, uh, expressed themselves that whenever they told me about it, I thought they were telling me that they didn't want me because uh, they hadn't planned. And it wasn't until uh, I mustn't get too emotional right at the beginning of this interview. It wasn't until the night before my father died, when we knew he was fading fast, um, that um my mother revealed to me that I had misunderstood that and that I was uh, an enormous um, happy surprise for them. So I lived <laughs> most of my life believing that I was a kind of unwanted presence in the family, not in any of because they were lovely to me. My parents were lovely. My mum's still still alive. Um, she's about to turn 93 soon. Um, and, uh, you know, they. I think I had a good childhood um both my parents my father was um, very working class and had grown up on a council estate and my mother was if it sounds awful to say it but i suppose lower middle class <laughs> like you know her father uh, worked in industry you know so he worked in a foundry but he also was a um uh, a steward on the aquitania you know, the uh, Cunard line uh, ship, he ended up running the first class bar. I've seen photographs of it. It didn't look that spectacular to me, quite frankly. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm from that sort of, I have um, a bit, even though you wouldn't think it from the way I speak, um, I, I had a bit of a, 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 my upbringing was with a working class mentality. We, we ate our main meal in the middle of the day, <laughs> 
it was dinner time at you know and i only did only discovered in my early teens that that was a real sort of class indicator in the uk we had some quite snobby neighbors who said well we're going to have lunch you're probably going to have dinner aren't you you know <laughs> so I, I but i had a, a pretty happy childhood i think um my parents did fight me on Doctor Who. They thought it was a waste of time and they tried every trick in the book to stop me from watching it. And and I've said before that, you know, had they just gone, oh, yeah, enjoy yourself, Doctor Who, whatever, I might not have been still so dedicated to it now. I think, you know, there was there was a battle to make Doctor Who important in my life. That, yeah, my parents always gave up battling with me. The times when they took me out, you know, for the day. And then I'd start getting edgy towards four o'clock in the afternoon because I thought, are we going to get back in time for Doctor Who on a Saturday? You know, they go, oh, turn the car around. He's going to have a, you know. So <laughs> I, it was always sort of eye rolling and, you know. And one of, one of my uh, defining moments in my childhood was watching uh, Patrick Troughton's final episode, but not knowing it was going to be his final episode and being you know, when he wasn't getting away from the Time Lords and he sort of makes that faux attempt to escape just to please Jamie. And I thought, you've got to try harder, Doctor, <laughs> you know. And I remember at the end of that episode, just completely uh, devastated. My mum just popped in and said, what's the matter with you? <laughs> I said, I think Doctor Who just died. And she went, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's sort of complete lack of empathy from, you know, parents who who were very empathetic in other matters so, so what are your yeah. early memories of doctor who oh really of, of um, william hartnell's sort of final series i remember the celestial toy maker and um and certainly i remember the 10th planet and i remember um being i discovered the other day that uh, russell t davis says almost exactly the same thing i remember being upset that william hartnell was leaving um, because children don't like change. So I must have known something of his doctor to be upset at the prospect uh, of, of him going. And I remember seeing, I don't know whether I even ever saw the final episode of The 10th Planet, but I remember seeing on a program we had called Junior Points of View with a guy called Robert Robinson, uh, Robert Robertson or Robinson, I can't remember which it is, uh, had a fantastic comb across haircut, um, pr uh, presenting it. And I remember him saying, is Doctor Who dying? And they showed the clip of William Hartnell lying there and his face starting to sort of glow, and which I remember, my memory of it is him sort of writhing in agony, but of course that's a completely fake memory. But I remember thinking, what? I mean, seriously how can he die and how can there be another face and i remember being very upset about it mainly because my chad valley picture show slides of doctor who you know those projector things your home projector things you put slides in with adventures on all my doctor who things were with william hartnell and i thought they're all now out of date <laughs> this is the wrong doctor um but i was quickly convinced by patrick charton and to remember all of his stuff uh, and from then on, you know, solid Doctor Who memories. I can navigate my life through what was on at the time. Uh, interestingly, um, uh, Stephen Noonan, who plays our new first Doctor, he's very much uh, preoccupied by dates and times. And he can kind of, and he's always looking stuff up and he's telling me, you know, what how old I was during particular episodes. I say, oh, I was probably about uh, six. He goes, no, you were seven and three quarters, Nick. And uh, you know, so, and he so he helps me navigate my life even more by the Doctor Who references. Was your brother too old to watch Doctor Who? I think he watched it a bit with me, but yeah, when you think a nine-year difference is a huge difference. And, you know, as a result of that, we're not particularly close. You know, we're not sort of horrible enemies or anything like that. But, um, you know, when he was interested in teenage things, I was very much an annoying little <laughs> expletive deleted, you know. <laughs> um, and I remember I remember him uh, babysitting for me once and, and he had a girlfriend with him. And I, I reported back to my mother everything that I'd heard them saying to each other. <laughs> you know in front of him <laughs> I remember subtle all sorts of strange intimate things that i didn't understand i remember him being absolutely furious with me which of course 
made it very amusing to me. But now looking back, I can realize that <laughs> I was the one at fault. <laughs> You're you're a big fan also of uh, classic TV of that particular era, sixties and seventies yes. in particular. Um, was that developing around the same time as Doctor Who, or is it as a result of Doctor Who that got you interested in classic TV, which wasn't classic at the time, but it is now? <laughs> no, well, that I mean, the thing is, you know, the rule was in those days because there were hardly any channels <laughs> in the UK. There was, you know, three round about them, and the BBC Two had been introduced. The rule was that you had to watch whatever was on television. You know, quite often you'd sit in front of the television and be thinking, I don't want to watch this, but there was no alternative. So you just watched it anyway. So you ended up watching a vast amount of stuff that you had that um, the affection for it was hard won. You know, you would remember things that you didn't like, but that you ended up watching because by the end of the first episode or whatever, you wanted to find out more. And, uh, and the, the process, that struggle that you went through with television back then, there's something, I don't know, you've, it feels like, <laughs> it isn't, but it feels like something of an achievement. And so you develop a strong retrospective affection for them. And uh, that's nostalgia, isn't it? I mean, the word nostalgia was invented to describe a disorder, wasn't it, of people who... Um, can't let go of the past and and focus overly on it and attribute far too many positive things to the past and don't look forward enough but um with regard to television if nostalgia is a sickness then i i i'm incurable you know uh, and it's lovely to revisit those series and often find that through adult eyes i like them even more uh, sometimes you think oh god why did i like that but you know i mean i find um I used to love Lost in Space, but I find it when I've tried to watch some of the later episodes of that now, they are just so ludicrous and so, I, I think, goodness me, how I, I, I can't bear them now. I like the early stuff, um, but uh, when it was taking itself a bit seriously, but when it is just a, a you know, a ridiculous, I mean, I, I love it from a humorous point of view, but I couldn't, you know, swallow a whole one <laughs> you know, of Dr. Smith. Most of the cast are just so furious about their scripting because everything's Mr. Smith, the boy and the robot. And you can see all the all the main cast were all hired and proper actors. They just look cranky the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that. But, I mean, you can see why the network did it because they thought this is what people love. Yeah. And, of course, those bits were great. You just didn't want, want them going on for the whole episode, really. Or I did as a kid, you see. I was a perfect example of the kind of audience they were aiming for. I loved all that and the robot constantly going danger will robinson and, and all that nonsense yeah i just i lived for that i i i possibly you know if we were to go back into my 1960s mind what a frightening prospect folks uh i probably at some stages loved lost in space more than i loved doctor who but look, doctor who's got the longevity you know and so it stayed with me and you build you build more and more loyalty as the years go by well, Lost in Space was self-contained as well, uh, self-contained episodes, whereas Doctor yes. Who was serialised, so it kept you hanging on for longer. <laughs> I suppose so. I, I think there were some cliffhangers in... Um, yeah, because what they used to do in Lost in Space, they'd finish the adventure, then they'd begin the next adventure. That's right, yes. A bit like some of the Hartnell episodes, and it goes, same time, same channel, Lost in Space. They, I, that's, the, that's the credits sliding in for anyone who's watching this. I'm accurately reproducing that experience for you folks. So with your um, love of nostalgic television that was developing mm. during those times, is that is that where you started to get aspirations for the arts? What, what, when did that begin for you? Interesting question. I remember the things that I liked best at school were writing stories, as we used to call it, and... Um, and art. I liked it to create some form of uh, enjoyable experience um, for, for those who looked at it. So yeah, for an audience, I suppose. And I wasn't particularly good at art. I did do an O-level in art, if that makes sense to anyone who's listening or watching this. Um, 
and I think I got a B or something like that. So I wasn't completely untalented in that uh, direction. But yeah, I used to come home from school and anything that had interested me during the day, you know, usually to do with history, to be quite honest. For a long time, I thought I wanted to work in a museum when I was a kid. That was because I loved going to museums and seeing the models and reading stuff about what had happened back in history. I would come home and I would get a, um, some drawing paper. I used to do lo loads and loads of drawing, uh, and but I would fold it in half. You know, I, I'd say, let's take uh, five pages, fold it in half, that, and then I'd staple it, and then I'd draw a cover, and I'd make a name up for the story, and it'd be something set during the Napoleonic Wars or something, or I don't know the Alamo um, and um, and then I would write or as I'd seen in books the title in there and the, you know and, and then I would write the story and it would have to fit the amount of pages and I'd say to my mum I'm writing a book this evening <laughs> and it's a bit like that now when I come to the shed I'm, I'm writing a play this evening um, and but I, I I'd finish it and you know it was entirely dictated by the amount of space in the book so sometimes the a few more drawings got in there to sort of pad it out a bit or other times you know the writing got smaller and smaller and smaller towards the end because I thought, I've got three more battles to get through and I've only got two pages left you know so I had that instinct to want to do that I used to make magazines and do story serials certainly when we moved to the Isle of Wight um, I would send um, sort of little magazine serialized magazine stories to my grandmother back in Southampton you know, for her to read, which I'm sure she was bored stiff by, but, you know, and they were mostly Doctor Who. Um, but yeah, so I was, I was always interested in doing that. And English was always my best and favourite subject at, at school. And even uh, English literature, actually, you know, I, I sort of really hit a sweet spot with that leading up to my O level, you know, when I was um, 16. I remember one of my schoolmates being, who'd always been always got better grades than me. He complained to the teacher that I started getting better grades <laughs> than him, a charming fellow that he was. Uh, uh, and she explained to him, I remember, that's why I used that term. She explained to him, Nick's really hit a sweet spot with this. He's really just, he knows what he's doing and he's doing well at it. And he, he seems to be able to do no wrong, you know. I don't know. I've, I found out how to read a book and write about it. That's what I found out about, you know. And uh, yeah, I kept getting good marks for it. So, so that was when I was, I, I suppose I should tell you that when I was in uh, infant school, I was in the school play playing, um, uh, I think it was, I don't know, it was, it was some Christmas play. And I remember we had to say it's a long way to Bethlehem. And we had to uh, repeat that over and over again. And I remember and we all, all in, you know, when, back in those days when you had to play characters from the Bible, you had to um, wear a tea towel on your head and wear a dressing gown. And that was meant to be uh, um, an accurate representation of ethnicity, which, of course, is appalling, really. But there you go. I'm feeling slightly warm at the relating of that. Um, and I remember being quite nervous about doing that play, but quite liking it. And then when I went to junior school, I had to stand up in one uh, assembly, you know, we had at the beginning of the day where typically everyone would sing hymns and say prayers and the headmaster would complain that people have been crushing infect disinfectant blocks in, in the toilet, in the urinals. That was a huge thing. Our headmaster was obsessed with this, that kids, in, you know, in the urinals, there would be these blocks of disinfectant and kids would think it was hilarious to stamp on them and, and fragment them everywhere. And it, the, the headmaster was so offended by this. He used to keep the whole school in every break time until someone confessed to it. Or Anyway, um, I digress massively. But I, there were four of us standing up there and we all had tiny bits of thin paper with a line from the bible in and we had to go along you know to read these bits out and when i went to read mine out i looked at the assembly crowd of kids and i had uh, an extreme pain in my stomach and everyone started to glow golden and i felt really sick and dizzy and then the next thing i rem i just vaguely remember hearing my uh, Czechoslovakian, as she was then, that's, I know that country doesn't exist anymore, teacher, say my line for me. And the next thing I remember waking up on some desks in a classroom and I'd passed out. And this made me uh, 
terrified of large crowds of people uh, in all assemblies. I had to stand at the end because if I was in the middle of a load of people, I would panic myself into passing out, basically. Um, so I was always near a door where I could get out. And the idea of getting up on a stage in front of people was I was terrified that that thing would happen again, which seemed to come from nowhere. I don't remember feeling nervous. I just remember suddenly feeling sick. And so, but I desperately wanted to do it. I wanted to perform and to tell stories and do exciting, fun stuff. But I was scared of it because this weird thing was going to happen to me. So every year when, when you know, at all the succeeding schools I went to, the, um, when they said, you know, who who's interested in doing the school play? I want to put my hand up and then I think, oh, no, that thing will happen. And then finally, when it's when I got to 16 years old, they, they asked again and I thought, the hell with it. And I put my hands up and I went and did an audition and I sang a song out loud in front of other people and everything. And people were because I'd never shown outwardly any ability in that direction. People were gobsmacked. And I got a really good part in the, the school play. And then I went mad and uh, arranged a school review, which was old Monty Python sketches and made up sketches based on Monty Python. And I, was, I became fascinated by getting reaction from an audience. And I, I did a sketch in inverted commas, which I thought was hilarious because of the shock value, which now I realize was utterly appalling, where I, we were doing a lot of doctor doctor jokes, you know, I feel like a pair of curtains, doctor, doctor, I feel like a pair of curtains, pull yourself together, you know, doctor, doctor, I think I'm a dog, um, something about uh, to, to sit down on the sofa, I'm not allowed to sit on the sofa, yeah, I tell jokes really well, don't I, uh, get John Levine on to tell the jokes, um, but the, I thought, um, I, I came up with this joke where someone would stagger on, I might have even heard it from somewhere else, and, and they just die, and they go doctor, doctor, and then they just die, and uh, the nurse says, doctor, what did what was the matter with him? And the doctor goes, I don't know. He didn't say <laughs> it's a terrible joke, but I thought I'd enhance it. And I'd come up with this brilliant idea. I don't know how I came up with it. It's not a brilliant idea. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> where I thought, what if he died in a really horrific, spectacular way? So I devised that we would put a hot water bottle full of fake blood down the front of this person's shirt so it's hidden so they'd come on and they'd collapse onto see i'd watched monty python and the holy grail and i loved all the bits where people's arms were being hacked off and there was blood squirting everywhere because it was just so outrageous it sort of really shocked me um and this person would collapse onto the table and then blood would just the pressure from the the on the hot water bottle would squirt the blood up through their neck and just out and <laughs> it worked brilliantly because this person sort of collapsed and it just went and it was pumping and pumping and pumping and whoosh, 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 splashing and before we did the sketch we did a special thing where everyone came out everyone in the cast came out and covered the stage in plastic you know <laughs> because of the blood that was and people were thinking what's going on what's going to happen and then this happened well you know several people uh, i think several people vomited <laughs> <laughs> passed out had to be escorted out of the school hall and you know the headmaster was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I just thought, well, it's funny though, isn't it? I, I mean, I think nowadays, if you did that in a school, you'd be referred to a psychiatrist and maybe locked up. But um, everyone just, you know, thought it was a bit of a laugh. I'd never did anything like that again. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you decide when you left school what you're going to do in terms of choosing between writing and acting? Well, because I'd had this sort of sudden last minute burst in comprehensive school, I don't know whether you'd call it high school, I suppose, um, uh, of suddenly finding my feet as a performer and everyone, frankly, telling me how marvellous I was at it in a kind of surprise, my God, you're incredible sort of way. It was the contrast. I don't think it was that I was particularly good. It was like from doing nothing and being quite shy to being very noisy and doing a lot, you know, the school play and basically writing and directing the school review which, by the way, after that became a thing doing a school review. There hadn't been a school review before I decided to do it. I think it's because I'd heard of the Cambridge Footlights Review. Um, um, after that, our natural course from our school was to go into a sixth form college where we do our A-levels. But there were also other colleges available. 
And there was a college in Southampton called Southampton Technical College, which was typically a place where people went to study engineering and uh, very physical, grown up, you know, hands on sort of stuff. But they also had a remarkable drama department where in the um, uh, the hall, the Southampton Technical College was the old workhouse building in Southampton. So in the gigantic hall, uh, it would have been the equivalent of where Oliver would have stood up and said, please, sir, can I have some more? <laughs> They'd painted all, all of it a deep purple color, painted out all the windows, and that was their drama studio. They had a, a lighting rig. And I went, so I, I went on the open day to it to find out what it was like. And when I arrived in that drama studio, and I saw the students who were there and how they referred to their tutor by first name and how, and I, cause I just got to that point. I, I'd matured very early as a teenager. You know, I'd grown up very quickly. My voice broke quite early on. I was, I was up to here with authority and being told what to do by people who I increasingly thought were idiots. Um, <laughs> and so when I went to this place and everyone was so relaxed, and so enthusiastic. I felt like I'd come home. I thought, God, this is great. And then when I went to the sixth form college open day and we were all chatting, waiting for someone to come in and talk to us and the headmistress came in and clapped her hands like that, quiet. I thought, I'm not coming here. You know, I'm not being, having hands clapped at me and told to be quiet. You know, I want to go to the place where they call their tutor Andrea and they don't have to wear uniform and all that kind of thing. So. I went on to, to do the um, diploma in drama as well as doing some A-levels in other subjects as well. And uh, there was a point, I don't know when, uh, possibly towards the end of the second year or first year, I'm not sure, uh, where I think our English tutor said, uh, which of you is thinking of going to university to do an English degree? And I put my hand up and everyone turned around and looked at me like I'd done something really stupid. And, and I said, what? They said, Surely you're going to drama school, aren't you? I thought, oh, am I? And they said, well, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, I, I probably am, aren't I? Yeah. So I applied for drama schools. And, and I suppose I had this romantic idea that I might be an actor. Uh, not, I mean, I did realise what a struggle it would be because everyone, that's the only thing everyone ever tells you about being an actor, that it's a massive struggle and you spend most of your time out of work. And that certainly was the case for me. I mean, there was a moment, by the way, before I went to technical college, that the headmaster of my school took the unprecedented step of getting me into his office. And he said, Nicholas, I hear you're considering going to the technical college to do a drama course. And I said, that's right. He said, well, you know your university material, don't you? He said, I'm not telling you what to do, but if I were your father, I would say, son, think again. And he was such a huge, uh, he was a very fair and but authoritarian um, headmaster. He'd been one of a Spitfire pilot in the Second World War. So he had a he had a real presence about him. You know, he was a survivor and he was a, a great man. And I thought, well, he has spoken. I can't go and do drama. Um, and I went home and I said to my mum, I, I can't go to tech college to do drama. And she said, why not? I said, well, Mr. K said that I can't, that I should go to university. And she said, yeah, but it's not Mr. K's life, is it? She said, you know, I think it's a bit mad for you to do drama. She said, but I know you, Nick, you know, you've got to do what you want. Otherwise, you'll be really unhappy. And if you want to do this, then you must do it. It's up to you. It's your decision which I think was top marks on the parenting there. When I tell mum about that these days, she just laughs as if, like she made a terrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so what was happening in terms of uh, Doctor Who fandom for you at this time, uh, around, around 1980, I suppose, that would be when fandom was really kicking off? Yes, I suppose it was, wasn't it? Previously, I thought I was the only Doctor Who fan on Earth. And then when I moved back from the Isle of Wight to the mainland in about 1973, late 1973, very late 1973, um, just after, you know, Planet of the Daleks and the Green Death. Um, I, I, I met for the first time in my life another Doctor Who fan, and it just happened to be the boy who was assigned to look after the new boy to walk me around. And I noticed that people were a little bit disparaging of him. Um, 
but I liked him. His name was Nick as well. I don't think I'd ever met another Nicholas. I thought it was like some freakish name that no one had, you know. And um, and then talking, we started talking about Hawaii Five O, which is a big show at the time. Da, 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 da. Um, and uh, and then he said, "Oh, I no, 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 like Doctor Who as much." Well. You like Doctor Who? Yeah, you know, expecting, you know, I expect anyone he told he liked Doctor Who went, oh, that's rubbish. That's it's all, you know. But I said, I love Doctor Who. And he said, so do I. Oh, I said, do you like it more than you like Hawaii 5 He said, oh, God, yes, you know. Um, so he and I, his name is Nicholas Layton. I, I'm sadly not really in touch with him anymore. Um, but uh, he and I became firm, firm friends. So Doctor Who fandom to me was Nick Layton. Um, and then uh, I went to drama school. And while I was away, Nick started to get involved in the organized fandom that you sort of mentioned the 19, 1980s. And he he got uh, involved with the Southampton local group of fandoms in which there was a, a, a horrific power struggle going on. Uh, I can't remember that the two sides. One of them was Bill Baggs and Bill Baggs wanted control of the local group. And um, uh I remember that Nick Layton spoke to Bill on the phone and he said he, he related this to me and he said, I spoke to this guy on the phone. And he said, and I thought he was like some 40 year old guy. And then he met him and he was 16 years old. But Bill always had that kind of, you know, very direct older person way of talking, which I think was the fact that I think his parents were sort of older than average and quite old fashioned. And I think he'd learned a very sort of old fashioned way of dealing with things. And so Nick really got embroiled in the whole thing of Bill Baggs's universe of, you know, wanting to do uh, amateur Doctor Who audio plays. And all that was kind of underway by the time I left drama school. And then, you know, so I came back and, and listened to what was going on. And they'd done this thing called The Space Whale, um, W-A-I-L, written by Gary Russell, I think under a pseudonym and um and i thought there were so many good things about it most of which was the music and the editing and nick had done the editing he was very talented with audio stuff and introduced me to all that actually um but the acting was almost universally terrible with a couple of notable exceptions like richard marzen who ended up producing blue peter um and was also sort of contributing editor to doctor who magazine um he was playing the companion greg and uh I, I thought I'd love to get involved in this, but oh, I'm supposed to be a professional actor now. I can't do things unprofessionally, non-professionally um, uh, or unprofessionally. Um, and, but I did get involved. I, uh, I ended up being the doctor in them and um, spending far too much of my time on it. I ended up writing them. I ended up writing them under my name, under various assumed <laughs> names. And I... Um, I did, started to learn how to edit and then even ventured into doing music uh, a lot of that so, really so you hadn't due... dabbled with music before doing these no no I'd, I'd messed around with with instruments and things on tape recorders when I was a kid you know I'd always been interested in sound because my brother uh, who ended up working in radio and television uh, you know he always had a tape recorder I don't know whether you can actually see it in the background or not. you could just pass that the, the Mooga Fuga box there. There's an old tape recorder. And that is my brother's old tape recorder, which, you know, I sort of inherited from him. It doesn't work anymore. Um, but I want to do something with it. Um, so, uh, but I, I, I've i always been frightened of learning music because my brother, <laughs> I mean, obviously it's my responsibility, but these are the contributory factors. My brother played the trumpet as a kid. And I remember... Um, him doing anything to avoid practicing it and also the boy next door played trumpet as well and i used to hear his father beating him because he wouldn't play it well enough uh, and him screaming in, in pain and distress so music to me got associated with pain distress avoiding it so even though i had a real i was always whistling tunes and humming tunes and uh, I was frightened of it. And I still, to this day, have a fear of, of um, you know, several people have said to me, you really ought to kind of learn the piano, Nick, because, you know, you, you've clearly got an interest in that kind of thing. I'm frightened of being constricted by, you know, the best means of knowing about music, which is learning about it properly. But then I consult myself and think that, you know, 
many uh, great composers, among which I do not count myself, but many of them have never, you know, could knew music, um, you know, properly. <laughs> they didn't, they weren't taught the notes, you know. So you don't read music? I don't no. read music, no, no. Do you play instruments? I mean, obviously keyboards. Yeah, well, I, I mean, through the, the magic of um, uh, multi-track recording and Pro Tools and MIDI and what have you, I'm able to um, uh, simulate a level of talent. <laughs> No, you, you, I mean, your stuff is great. I mean, a lot of the Thank modal you. stuff, that, especially the early um, Cyberman stuff and even the, the Dalek Empire stuff, the music in that's brilliant. Well, it's the, it's what I hear in my head and I try to create it and obviously fail. And the the somewhere between the two, something acceptable comes out. Oh, it's, it's more and than I, acceptable. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, I, was, I, I should say that I was helped at the very beginning with the audio visuals plays, which is why I was alluding to with all this uh, amateur Doctor Who stuff, um, by uh, Jim Mortimer, who later became, you know, got some notoriety in fandom for writing um, Doctor Who books, didn't he? And, and Jim was uh, uh, a very good musician and he let me borrow some of his synthesizers. He had all sorts of, you know, I, I would go around to his place and it was just like an Aladdin's cave of stuff. And he would talk to me and he, he would compose music for the audio visuals plays while I was there. And he would talk to me about what, I, how I wanted it to sound. And he would, he, he was really collaborative and uh, a, a really important influence on me. Actually, he, he made me feel that it was possible for, for me to do it. I said, could I borrow one of those keyboards maybe? And he would, yeah, sure mate. Yeah, yeah, you know, it was, it was lovely. I like the way Jim Mortimer makes me always think of the audio visuals in the natural history of fear through oh, yes. one of the old audio visuals theme tunes in there. Uh, he as, did as, indeed, didn't he? Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> Very cool. So, so your time playing the doctor, how was that mm. for you? Uh, it was great fun. Um, yeah, I really loved it. Uh, but with a slight tinge of guilt because, you know, um, I, th I think that, I think Margaret Thatcher's government's paid for me to do because <laughs> I was I wasn't really doing anything else. I was devoting my entire life to that and signing on really. Uh yeah. I mean I was I suppose applying for jobs as well but uh yeah. It was a long long period of um of unemployment and a lot of uh, and a lot of depression really. I mean all my life I've I've fought um I've I feel I said to someone recently, I feel like my life is, um, I'm stalked by an enormous, invisible beast, like a bear, that, that, and I can't ever see it, and it will suddenly leap out on me at an unexpected moment and make me extremely depressed. I'm, I'm of that generation that, you know, that's still a little bit ashamed of things like that. So I don't, I, I, sh I think I should have had counseling and maybe some medication i don't know i know a lot a lot of friends of mine who who uh, you know are very um upfront and realistic about any uh, mental health issues they've had and have sought help and and got medication that works really well for them and i i still am to this day uh, and i suppose forever will be yeah haunted by it and so really doing those plays back in those days was was kind of a, a therapy uh, for me to avoid this awful feeling of you know lack of self-worth and um uh, yeah sorry this is so depressing isn't it no, no, I mean, <laughs> a, a, a lot a lot of the writers we speak to here um a lot of the creatives you can see we talk about the the, the, the black dog um mm. Is that an expression that you're using? Mine's a bear. bear. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. But, but, so but yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. yeah, strange expression is you know, talking about the black dog. Um, a lot of the writers we talk to seem to struggle with that, um, yes. and you know, and, and always, always doubting their work, always doubting the reception. Um, I've, I've heard you sometimes talk about your writing and, and similarly thinking there's almost a, a lack of assurance and confidence in what you do. How mm. do you? Yeah, how do you get over that when you're writing in terms of how do you struggle through that? It's a really, it's a, like a catch-22 situation with writing and crea creativity in general, I think, because in order to um, 
uh, lift off with it and feel like you're soaring into the sky with it, you have to feel like you've got permission to do it. But in order to feel like you've got permission, you have to have done it a lot. And I feel that I, the best thing for writing is to write, <laughs> um, you know, because, and to finish things. It's ironic the company I've spent a large part of my life working on what's called big finish because <laughs> it is to do with finishing you know uh once you realize you can do it it kind of gives you a permission to do it and i've you know by the position i find myself in in big finish i can give myself permission you know that doesn't help when you feel that there are detractors uh who you know but you can't you know, everyone has subjective views on things. And, uh, you know, luckily for me, most of what I do seems to go down mostly well with, with most people, I'd say. And that gives me another tingle of permission as well. And this is why I say to people, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm helping uh, to uh, progress their careers at Big Finish, like Heather Challens, who before we chatted, we, we talked about a bit, you know, she's my executive assistant, but also she works as a producer at Big Finish and the thing you know I did a mentoring scheme with her and I you know and I talked about you know feeling that you have the right to do it and if there was one thing I wanted to communicate to her and that I continue to communicate to her is that she has the right she has the permission and just try as much and like everyone we're all full of self-doubts but play a trick on yourself and pretend that you know that and then you're you're more than halfway there, I think. Yeah. There, there are some people who set out to cause pain, it feels like, like just to make unnecessary negative comments. H how do you cope with the media, Twitter, tweets, those sort of things, when people just, yeah, just for no particular reason, just want to say particularly nasty things and then want to, mm. and they want to link you into it? <laughs> I mean, I said, it's, it's one thing, it's one thing to have that's, an opinion about it, something, but then to actually, hey, let me show Nick how much I hate this. <laughs> like it stags me when that happens. How do you how do you react to that? Well, you know, everyone has a point of view, and I, in my heart of hearts, don't believe that anyone is actually truly malicious. I think that what they're doing is expressing what they think is right, and that what what irks them about something, and they feel a compulsion to express it, uh, and it from my point of view it or your point of view or anyone else's point of view it may not seem reasonable and it may seem hate filled filled but they are doing it for some reason they have a belief system um, that makes that the right thing to do uh, so you have to step back and just think it's their way now as Dwayne knows you know I've occasionally been sucked in uh, and got told off for it uh, where I just where someone wrote you know it wasn't even a bad review. It was just a kind of, oh, this is a bit naff. And I just thought, what a mean-minded, arrogant little review that was. you know. And I said it online, which, of course, everyone went, oh, you can't say that. You can't criticise the criticisers. And I, my opinion was, well, you know, you're going to be rude about me. I think I'll be rude about you. But ultimately, it just becomes a terrible custard pie fight, doesn't it? And, you know, and it's just a mess. And everyone looks stupid. So best not to have the fight. Best to... Uh, ignore uh, ignore it as much as possible you can it's really difficult to ignore the praise <laughs> you know you see you're supposed to ignore both those imposters but when people say nice things about your work you know but it will only take one one negative comment and then the, the, all the positive comments needn't ever have happened because you just forget all those because it speaks to the the person that sort of it speaks to the big bear the invisible bear it says, come and get him. Come and get him now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like a whistle to the to the nasty bear. That's go I've got nothing against bears, by the way. It's just an analogy. <laughs> yeah. That's how I deal with it. And it, yeah. And I find myself more and more giving advice to other people of dealing with it that way. But I can tell that a lot of them are not ready to hear that advice. Yeah, it's, well, we, uh, we, we work hard in terms of you've got nothing nice to say, don't say it. <laughs> so well, I think that's a lovely principle you, you, i mean it, you can tell what we don't like to talk about it 
Yeah. <laughs> to, yeah. To live their silent, you know, that, but also when we praise, we praise because we actually mean it. Um, but often it's about lack of understanding. We um, we spoke to Jonathan Morris recently, hmm. and you know, there's something in one of his stories that neither of us liked. Actually, there's two things. We talked about a performance and, and, a, and something that was another story we didn't like. We actually spoke to him. He actually had exp- explanations for both. He apologised for them both. <laughs> um, exp- <laughs> and they explained that both. Actually, they made so much sense when you actually yeah. understood. And so that's you know, the value of actually having a conversation is is valuable, but we've lost the art of conversation and that politeness. And I think the conversation thing is important because it humanizes. You know, the thing is when people criticize something, everyone involved, you know, they couldn't voice that criticism to the person were they in front of them. And that tells you something, doesn't it? I think the nasty criticism is for when you're having a few drinks with your mates down the pub, and you're being unreasonable on purpose, you know, just just for the hell of it. And the trouble is with the internet, it's taken that conversation and put it in front of millions of people. And it shouldn't be there. Or rather, if it is happening, the person who the criticism is being voiced about shouldn't be there. And I think Stephen Moffat said this. I can't work out whether it was Stephen or I who said it first publicly, but we both said it to each other privately. But that's not, a, that's like, when you go online and there's there's a thread or something, I don't look at any of those things now. But you know, I remember the day when you did look at a thread of conversation, and you you you. It's almost like walking into a room and finding a bunch of people slagging you off. And the best thing to do is to quickly get out of the room. That conversation is not for you. You've you've wandered into the wrong territory. Leave it to them. This is their territory. They let them slag you off. Let them talk about how you know. My, I'm proud of what, my best slag off tweet was someone said um, early on in the fourth Doctor stuff we did that there were um, that we do. Um, they they quoted the number of plays that had been released and then the number of ones I'd written, which at that early point was the majority of them. And at the end, they quoted those two numbers and so and so number written by Nicholas Briggs. And then they put, please make it stop. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you know, that's like an accolade to me because I, I like being completely misunderstood. You know, I don't like I, I don't like it when people uh, sort of just go, oh, it's all right. I mean, you know, I, I quite like it if people violently dislike my stuff you know, or violently love it. But the in-between stuff, it's just when you feel that you've laboured so hard, you've stared at the empty page, you've doubted yourself and you've come up with this thing and you feel glorious about it and you have a great time recording it and everything. And then someone goes, yes, well, I think I preferred the one that came out afterwards. They go, oh, that's far more crushing than someone saying, I hate you, Nick Briggs, and everything you do makes me sick. I feel that's some form of achievement. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take it back to audio visuals. And mm. Bill had stepped back slightly. Gary had come in. Uh, was it at that <laughs> was it at that point at the, the final audio visual season that you and Gary sort of uh, cemented your relationship there? Yeah, I mean, I love the way you sum up that thing. <laughs> there, and, uh, I I won't go back into those times. It was all, you know, handbags at dawn. Um, but uh, yes, I suppose it was. And Gary and I spoke a lot about. I mean, you know, I had close proximity to Gary, and because uh, I was his lodger, <laughs> so uh, you know, I was in his spare room. So he and John Ainsworth and I, you know, spent a lot of time discussing all this. Um, And at some point, Gary and I, I remember distinctly us having a conversation where we thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could do this properly one day, you know, with the Doctor Who's off the telly? I thought, "Uh, yeah, I suppose so. (laughs) Um, uh, Yeah, we we thought it'd be a great idea. And then, you know, Gary saw an opportunity for it. Um, I think through talking to Steve Cole at BBC Worldwide, as it was then, Steve, who's, you know, a massively successful children's author and one of the nicest people you could ever meet, actually. Um, I think, and then Gary got, Gary thought we need money (laughs) to do this. And I know my childhood friend, Jason Hagelary, is a very successful businessman. So let's see if he's got some money. And, you know, of course, Jason's a massive Doctor Who fan. And I think Gary got Jason to do something about it. And then Jason sorted it all. And yeah, 
but yeah that is when gary and i i think um yeah that and he's i hardly ever see gary these days and um well it's it's a funny thing you know i found out the other day a particular thing had happened in his life not nothing terrible terrible but i just phoned him up and i hadn't spoken to him for several years and it was sort of i think there were about three seconds where he was slightly taken aback to hear from me but then just after that minuscule amount of time we were just chatting about stuff our lives have sort of gone in slightly different paths but i think you know i'll always love him he's such a massively important but i mean you know if we wanted to go on more about my depression which i'm sure folks we don't um you know gary was really a really important um help to me um i first when i'd moved out of his place i ended up getting a um a flat very nearby. I was looking for flats in different parts of London and I came to stay with him while I was looking for flats. And he said, um, why don't you come and live around here? Because then we'll be near each other and we can see each other. And I thought, yeah, why don't I do that? So I lived quite genuinely five minutes walk from where Gary lived, where I'd formerly lived. And he and I would just inhabit each other's homes. I mean, he would, um, I mean, he, he didn't have a key to my flat but I had a key to his because I used to live there and I never gave the key back so I would just let myself in and wander in and he'd be in the living room I'll go hiya uh and then make him a cup of tea and bring it into him so um it was when he finally moved from that place it was really difficult for me to give that key up but I guess the the next owners didn't want me just walking in and making tea and he would come round to my place all the time just you know uh, he'd usually ring me beforehand so I could just open the door. But he would, you know, sometimes if if the doorbell rang, it would probably be Gary Russell. We had endless cups of tea and discuss things about Doctor Who, about our our lives, our loves, our our hatreds, our you know, just very, yeah, a very important person in my life who who hardly features in it at all now, which, which is odd, but it's always. Um, it's always lovely to see him on those rare occasions when I do. And I, I hope I see him again, you know, as soon as possible. I guess the connections that Gary made through, um, through Doctor Who magazine and, of mm. course, you, you were doing um, Myth Makers through the 80s and 90s. So you were making yes. connections with, with various cast from the series and other people making yeah, connections. Yeah, it might, that, even that... Have been, might even have been Gary who put me in touch with Keith Barnfather. Is that right? Been. I'm not sure, but that was certainly all right. Because Keith Barnfather, Bill Baggs arranged an audio visuals convention that Gary was at, of course, and I was doing sorts of silly things. And he got Keith Barnfather to come and video it. I'm doing the inverted commas things for those of you just listening. Um, because the camera he was using was so old that when you, you got the image on the camera and then when the person moved, the previous image of them was still there. So it was like a ghost leaving a body. You know what I mean? The the tube on the camera got burnt so easily. But yeah, and it was after that that Keith phoned me up and asked me if I'd like to come and earn no money. <laughs> but as a fan, pleasure. you'd do it, of course. Oh, God, it was an amazing opportunity, actually. Excuse me, just having a little uh, refreshment break. Um, that was water. Um, it's, it's Keith, got, Keith it's got, does that too. He 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 does video events. Uh, I I put on an event. Um, oh, it must be eighteen years ago or something. And two days later, I was picking him up from the airport to come and video it. So so that oh. was, he was pretty. Two excited days about. later. Yeah, he jumped straight After on a plane. The, oh right, wow. straight on a plane because I had um, Tristram Carey and Dudley Simpson and Mark Strip Strixon together. So uh, right. he wanted to come and film that. He did. That's where he did Dudley's Mythmakers that week that weekend. So was that the one that they, they'd given up editing me into them by then? Had they? I, the, you're on there. You're oh, on I am. There. All right. Because um, right. I you, ended you're, up. Just you're doing, doing the introduction. I think you're doing the introduction. Yeah. So I did so I was... many of those introductions. I've lost track of them. And people, I find people, you know, people asking me about a certain guest. I say, "Oh, what was Jack Pitt like?" You know. Uh, I said, I don't know. I never met him. They said, but you interviewed him. I said, no, no, no. That that was done at a different location months later, <laughs> with yeah. a background that vaguely matched the one that Jack was sitting in front of. Jack Pitt was a an extra in Doctor Who, by the way, who shared a flat with William Hartnell. Dot dot dot. Fade to black. <laughs> it was, <laughs> it, it was, it was quite thrilling for me because when when that video 
or DVD came out, mm. um, the first Eccleston series had come out, and so my daughter was watching with me, and I was saying, "Oh, that that guy that did the voice for the Daleks, I'm on that DVD in the credits with him." It's it was all a very very fanny, very fanny. Wow, it was good. <laughs> I'm, I'm honoured that we shared the same screen space. <laughs> <laughs> We Gosh, did. yeah. Well, Myth Makers was an incredible uh, journey for me, really. Um, uh, I mean, I don't think I was ever any good at it, um, and and I was constantly um, yeah, <laughs> troubled by that. And also, it's just, I mean, all the clothes I was wearing. Like here, I am sitting here in a ridiculous flowery shirt, so I've only got myself to blame. Um, you know, it's just horrific looking back at the various uncomfortable clothes <laughs> I was wearing doing myth makers and my nervousness really um yeah I learned a lot doing it and you can I think you can tell the difference between the early ones and the later ones I think um Sophie Aldred and uh Colin Baker were sort of landmark ones for me I think Sophie because she's the same age as me and I think for the first time I was interviewing someone my age and possibly Sarah Sutton as well Sarah's my age as well um maybe there's a slight year one way or the other and Nicola as well um that uh I just felt more confidence talking to someone my own age and and Sophie puts you at ease and Colin Baker was amazing to me really he was just um a, a delightful human being um and his attitude towards me was uh, you're in charge you're doing the interview I trust you you know whenever I was a bit hesitant oh Colin it's up to you, honestly. Whatever you want is best for me, Nick. You know, and it's so empowering. Um, uh, no nonsense, but in the right way, no nonsense, you know. Um, you know, the opposite of, you know, dear John Pertwee, who uh, I was a quivering wreck by the end of that. Yeah, because John, I would John be Pertwee too. didn't, yeah, he didn't trust anyone to get anything right, uh, especially someone who instantly, uh, um, betrayed you know behavior patterns of someone who was unsure of themselves i think if i'd been very sure he would have been fine with me but because i wasn't he immediately saw weakness and thought that this guy this guy's going to mess it up unless i tell him what to do so it's very difficult to interview someone where they're constantly stopping it and saying no 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 i don't want to talk about that i want to talk about this can we cut cut can we do it again all this kind of stuff was going on and it's just and there's you know, one of your heroes there just being utterly beastly to you. But he didn't mean it in that way, you know. And there were other occasions where I bump into him and he would speak with great affection in his voice. Hello, Nick. All right, then. You know, I thought, oh, one minute you hate me and the next minute you love me. I don't know where I am. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you know, he liked me when I was just being a human being, but didn't like me when I was being incompetent and unsure of myself. I think it's the bottom line of what was what was happening there. But yeah, yeah. Uh, Colin really at that point i decided that i wasn't an actor anymore because i just hadn't made a success of it and myth makers was giving me my little bit of you know performance tingle uh, but i was working in publishing in inverted commas for visual imagination uh, uh, you know doing starburst and tv zone and i'd really decided that that, that was it uh, and I would just carry on doing stuff like that. And then it was Colin Baker who said to me, you're really good at all this stuff in front of the camera stuff. And, you know, what's happening with acting? And I said, oh, nothing. And he said, well, well, I could get you an acting job if you like. I said, really? He said, yeah, yeah, sure. Now, a number of other actors had said that to me in Mythmakers, and none of them had ever followed it through. But Colin did. Colin got me a job in Weekly Rep down in uh, Sidmouth in um, Devon, uh, which was a real to use a favourite Doctor Who fan phrase, baptism of fire, uh, <laughs> where I was an assistant stage manager and playing leading parts as well. So I was sort of, you know, just about to go on stage as Rochester or someone whilst having just edited the, the show's sound tape and I cut myself with razors and stuff, you know, you know. Oh, Nick, we need this sound cue altering. I'm just playing the lead. OK, I'll go through that. And then, you know, uh, so, yeah. So Colin really got me back into the whole acting thing, which is, I often mention is when I'm at an event and I have a very long queue for autographs and Colin, uh, you know, is uh, saying to me, why is his queue so long? You know, I often say to him, I'm only here because of you though. What? I say, because of you, I wouldn't have got back into acting if it weren't for you. <laughs> so in a way, Colin, you've only got yourself to blame. 
but of all the doctors, he is he is the one who I sort of know the best. He's the one who I could I feel comfortable just phoning up now, just to sort of say, I've just done this interview, Colin, and I mentioned you, you know. So yeah. So he was very so myth makers did help me a lot. But then I just became too busy to do them, really. You know, it was becoming more and more of a strain for Keith to, you know, work things around me. So, you know, I think, and I suggested Robert Dick to, to because I'd seen Robert do so many interviews at conventions. I suggested Robert Dick to uh, come in and take over. From Big Finish Productions, Dalek Empire. Dalek Empire. What was that thing? A Dalek? Suze, we've got to get off this planet and fast. What? The Daleks are going to wipe us out, and if they don't... What? What is it, Albie? You'll soon wish they had. Silence! No! No, I won't be silent! Just kill me too, that's what you do, isn't it? Humanoid exhibiting behaviour of abnormality within higher plane response parameters. Have you got any plans? Or are you just making this all up as you go along? You will proceed into the cell! <laughs> Stop that! <laughs> you! Stop that! Do not make that noise! My name. Your name? Karlendorf. Sus. It was nice knowing you, Sus. Whoa! What the hell was that? You spilt the coffee. You have done well. You will speak to the humanoid female alone. It is important that you understand the futility of resisting the Daleks. And if you try to work us any harder, it'll stop permanently because we'll all be dead. These are the creatures who flattened every city on this planet, blotted out the sun, choked out the atmosphere. They came screaming out of the skies, gunning down anyone who wasn't fast enough to get out of the way. This is Fleet Commander Karlendorf aboard flagship Courageous. This is the beginning of the final battle. We have come a long way together, have we not? Indeed. Many years of war. And now we stand upon the brink of victory. Suze and Mendes must be located! We are right! Victory for the Daleks! Victory for the Daleks! That signal was a distress call from the Emperor of the Daleks. No! You're working for the Daleks, aren't you? No. No, we're not working for the Daleks. We're not working for either faction. Death to the Daleks. Death to the Daleks! When I said those words, I saw the crowds overpowering my Dalek guards. For, for a moment, I thought I was going to live. Exterminate! No! Enemy Daleks? Aren't all Daleks enemies? Enemy Daleks have committed the greatest crimes known to our universe. Why are these Daleks your enemies? Their actions contravene everything the Daleks in our universe stand for. And what do you stand for? Peace. Order. Variant 7? Isn't that the proposed cure for the NFS play? Governor, find me the Daleks. Ah! Oh dear, where the hell is it? Having trouble? What? Report! There's one. I've been tailing him for weeks. He must be recruited to our cause! I, I, I don't know what to do! <laughs> Anymore! Oh. And what if we don't? You kill all of us, is that how it works? As I said, the Daleks have full executive powers here. The Daleks wish only to help you. How does killing people help us? Begin activation of the tectonic devices. Probes responding to activation signal. Power levels stabilizing. Increase power. Here comes a lovely cup of coffee. And what? Lovely and warm. Victory! 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 As 
the Dalek fleet advanced, all our defenses were brushed aside and star system after star system fell. Our galaxy is being colonized, enslaved. Slave workforce efficiency is maintained by the human traitor, Susan Mendes. We're becoming part of the Dalek Empire, and as the years pass, it seems we can do nothing to stop the Daleks. This is what we're calling the Spacer. As you can see, it strongly resembles a spacesuit. Any man or woman of fighting age can step up here, take off the rags and skins you're wearing now, and put on one of these. Its wearer controls it by means of vocal commands, mental impulses, and delicate muscular control. No way. You can go. You can go right now! These human beings must be exceptional. What are you going to do to us? You will be transported as slave labor. A regiment we will call the Fearless. My people will fight to get in his squad. They think he's some sort of miracle worker. Well, that's the biggest Dalek fleet I've ever seen. Big finish. We love stories. Okay, Philip, so that was the first part of our in-depth chat with Nicholas Briggs, and it's great to get some of these new insights from yeah, he, is. he was very honest and very open, and yeah, it's, yeah, yeah very, very uh, honest about his life, which was a good thing to do. Looking forward to uh, the next part, which may not be next time, maybe in a few episodes' time, so stay tuned. Follow us on Facebook, uh, Twitter... Uh, you can subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, make sure you uh, subscribe to us on whatever podcatcher you are subscribing to, and you will keep up to date with the next episode as it drops. Yeah, if you really like us, write us a review. Give us a five star on your podcast of choice because those reviews really get you know get seen and get noticed and would help a lot. Yeah, we did. We certainly noticed. We did get one recently, and I was going to read it out on this episode, but I forgot. So I'll read it out on another episode. Okay. Good. Sound good? Sounds great. What about our recommendations for this week, Philip? What have you got for us? Because I know for a fact that it's your turn to go first. It's my turn to go first. Well, yeah. we haven't talked to um, Mr. Mr. Briggs yet about this because we will in the second part. But <laughs> I've just finished listening to um, Sherlock Holmes, the, the latest one released. There's, there's not a lot of Sherlock Holmes releases from Big Finish at the moment, unfortunately, because I think they're great stories. But whenever they come out, they're really worthwhile. Mm. Uh, the latest one that I've just listened to recently come out is The Fiends of New York. So Nicholas Briggs is just wonderful in it. Um, Lucy Briggs Owens is also in this. Dr. Watson's wife. Um, always a great cast, strong cast. But I just love the dialogue. It's so rich. It's so um, poetic. Um, so yeah, it, it, it sounds like nothing else in the, in the Big Finish range. But it's really worth listening to. Love the story. Love the music. It's great. So, if you haven't listened, if you haven't listened to Sherlock Holmes stuff, get into it. And there's some free ones out there. Yes, I think the um, Speckled Band is free, which is a is a great short story by Conan Doyle, Doyle but adapted. Um, I'd get get in there and start listening to some and Sherlock Holmes stories like Hound of the Baskervilles is quite yep. inexpensive as well. If you want to grab a download of that, yeah. And there's there's a run, one of the, the um, Titanic one. Or the shipwreck mariner. I think it's something about the mariner. It's it's just stunning. And some of the box sets that Jonathan Barnes has been writing, uh, amazing, amazing stuff there. So the perfidious, the perfidious mariner. Is that is that the word? Perfidious. It is perfidious yeah. mariner. Yeah, yep. that's it. All very good stuff. Yep. I, I finished listening. I finished listening to it today. So, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. And then we end up talking to Nick about so much stuff. It didn't really come up. But there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh... Yeah, it's a shame. But what do you want to recommend, Dwayne, for us? I'm going to recommend a couple of television shows I've been watching, Philip. Of course you are. Don't wrap me over the knuckles. They are totally related to audio Doctor Who. The first one, well, it's not. It's related to TV Doctor Who. The first series that I've just started watching is The Time Traveller's Wife. Now, have you seen that advertised? It's, well, I know it's by Stephen Moffat and it's getting some great reviews. It is really well done. It's been... I can't remember if I've ever actually seen the movie, which stars our Eric Banner. That's the I movie haven't. version, uh, which is available too, I think, on stand. So I might 
give that a look at some stage. But the series is really good. You can really hear Stephen Moffat's words coming through in the dialogue, the way he expresses uh, his his scripts. Uh, and it's very timey-wimey. Obviously, this was the inspiration for River Song and Amy, because we've got a little red-haired girl uh, who becomes this guy's wife that time travels around the place and they always meet out of order. That's obviously the inspiration for River Song. But it's one of those... It's one of those Robert Holmesisms that Stephen Moffat does so well. He's pinched the idea and put it into Doctor Who and made it work spectacularly. So uh, I think that's uh, really cool. The other show that I want to recommend, I just noticed on Brickbox, it's called The Replacement. It stars Vicky McClure, who for anyone who watches Line of Duty, you'll know Vicky McClure. Anyone who watches Outlander, it's got Richard Rankin in it. Uh, but for Doctor Who fans, uh, there are a few notable uh actors in there Morven Christie she was in Under the Lake and Before the Flood uh, so she has the star role in this series you've got Shaborn Redmond uh, with a reasonably major guest cast in it who plays the Rani for Big Finish uh, you've got Neve McIntosh as well who plays Madame Vastra for the TV series and for Big Finish so and it's also written and directed by Joe Ahern who was very oh. involved in series one of the the tv series so i think joe Hearn's first doctor who story was dalek i would that was the, that, that, was, that, that was that that was the first one that's uh, in order i don't know where it was uh, recorded film first but it was the first of his that was released so the replacement check it out on britbox um it's uh, really really cool yeah that's my recommendations Sounds great. <laughs> All right, we'll be back soon. Make sure you stick, stay tuned uh, to the feed because if you want to catch the rest of Nick's interview, uh, that will be coming in future episodes or an episode. If we put it in one or two, I'm not sure yet. But uh, that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed it. I certainly did. I hope you did too, Philip. I certainly did as well. Thank you, Dwayne. Thanks, everyone. We'll catch you all next time. This has been the Sirens of Audio, episode 115, Starting Small. Part one of our chat with Nicholas Briggs, with your host Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. Contact us or check out all our details at sirensofaudio.com. Drop us a line at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or drop a comment on our socials or our YouTube channel and let us know your thoughts on this or any one of our episodes. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll catch you next time.